uh, next 45 minutes or so, we're just going to chat it up about mules and donkeys. We want to hear from you. We want to hear what's been going on. Last week, we did a little bit of a special show. We've got a brand new mule saddle training course that I kind of went through and explained. And there was one thing that I said last week, Steve, that was incorrect. Well, there might have been more, but there was one that I realized. We were ta- I was talking about what I had learned from you when it came to the space that you want with, uh, between the, the chest and the breast collar and the space that you want in between the rump and the breeching. And I said half an inch. And when I told you that, you go, half an inch? I said, oh, man, was it not half an inch? You go, inch and a half. I was like, oh, I was so close. But we did a really good job. Everyone showed up. We had a lot of fun, but we missed you. We're so glad that you're back this week. Well, I'm sorry I'm running late. My optometrist had uh, seen that I have a few more problems. At 70 years old, I'm going to start wearing my glasses more often now. (laughs) And uh, so... Anyway, they had had me a little bit late. Plus that, I'm a little bit fuzzy right now. You know, when they put that stuff in your eyes, you can't see nothing. Is that what so, they do to dilate them? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I had to feel my way back to the house. Well, you're uh, there. You arrived, yeah. and we're happy that you did. So um, I'm pulling up. We had a little bit of trouble since we started later than we were planning on it. Had a little bit of trouble getting the original Facebook um, Facebook live stream to work. So... Um, I am logging in right now to make sure that we can see all of the Facebook comments and all of the YouTube comments. Um, So as I'm doing that, uh, folks, uh, the thing that I wanted to make sure to say is that uh, there's three things that we ask. Number one, uh, go ahead and let us know that you're watching. Let us know that you're here. Let us know that you're hanging out. and Let us know where you're watching from. It's just a lot of fun to know that uh, we're not alone. We're in community together. And there's folks all around the world hanging out with us. Uh, The second thing that we ask is that you ask any and every mule question that you got. So whatever you're working through right now, whatever you're working on, if you're stuck on something, if you need a little bit of clarity, just want to bounce some ideas off, go ahead and ask those. And then the last thing we ask is that you share the broadcast. If you're watching on Facebook, down below there's a little button that says share. Just share that out to your wall so that folks know uh, that we're doing this here every single week. And so, Steve, the question that I want to get off uh, right on the start, right to start with, is about saddleless or treeless saddles. Are treeless saddles okay to ride with the mule? You know, they're not really good to ride with anything, uh, mules, donkeys, or anything, anything like that. We have to remember these mules and donkeys and horses were never designed for us to sit on their back. Uh, I want you all to get an idea. Uh, just put a, a backpack on your back and just walk around your normal every day and tell me how long it takes before your back starts getting sore, let alone put a 50 pounds of saddle on and then 150 pounds of saddle. The, the, you know, for a short time in an arena, maybe doing a few things, maybe. But I have seen in result of what it looks like to see spines out of place uh, for a variety of reasons. The idea of the bar on the saddle, the bars on the saddle is to evenly distribute the weight of your body across the ribs at the loin area. That's the purpose. And you cannot do that when you have no bars in a treeless saddle. Now here's one of the problems that we found as we run into this stuff that I've had professionals show me veterinarians and they show me x-rays and things like this, right where the front cinch pulls down on the pummel, there's a lot of pressure right there. And that front cinch is there and that tends to put out a shoulder or a rib or maybe even a joint on the, on the uh, spine. And then the other thing is, the other, if you do use a back cinch, unfortunately, not only do a lot of our treeless saddle folks don't ride with the rear cinch, they only ride with the front cinch. So now you're doing even more problems, even though, yes, you've got a breaching on a mule, the back cinch is the tightest. Now, when you put the back cinch on a treeless saddle, uh, now you've, you've got a pressure point on one side of the saddle, a pressure point on the other side of the saddle, and those pressure points is where the, the vertebrae go out. Muscles get sore, things like this. 
Um, the meals tell you, folks, uh, they tell you in a short time, don't think that just riding, uh, you know, a couple hours and then by golly, you, you know, we don't see any problems. So we'll keep on riding. Folks, it builds up over time. Take and put a pair of small shoes on and see how long it takes before you start walking funny. So that's the long version of it. The tree is what's important to the mule. There's nothing else more important to that mule than how those bars set across the back. That's extremely important. Absolutely. So talk a little bit about, let's just follow that up. Um, folks may, may not understand why you'll want to ride with a rear cinch. And a lot of times we'll notice folks are tightening it up real nice and tight in the front with a cinch when they're riding a horse. Um, talk a little bit about why you must always ride with the rear cinch and then what tightness you want for the front and the rear. Yeah, I was just talking with a man today from uh, Coos, 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 I think it is, uh, Oregon. And he said how he was using his saddle and he noticed that um, when he tightened the front cinch, the back of the saddle was setting up. And he, and, and he would sit on it. And then, of course, then the saddle was doing this. He didn't really realize that. Now, he did have a rear cinch, but he had a billet. So he had a long strap with a short little leather uh, cinch on it. So he went ahead and snugged that up, hoping that would help. Problem is, he kept having dry spots in the front. Well, why, why is that? That's because the scapula goes up and down, up and down like pistons. Well, watch behind the scapula right here, and there's an area about this big where your front D-ring is. You will see that that's the place where you'll have the most white hairs and the dryness. Now, just because you go and you change over to another pad or another saddle or even my saddle is you've already killed the hair follicles in that area in behind the scapula. That's why you see the dry spots, folks. Uh, that's, that's one of the reasons. It's, it's not only is it pushing with your bar from being tightened in the front that's creating the dry spots. Now you kill, kill the hair follicles. And when you have white hairs, that means those hair follicles have pretty much died off. Now, here's the good thing about this mules. Uh, they shed every year. So every spring you're going to see the hairs shed off. Every spring, you're going to see white hairs. <laughs> yeah, especially if you didn't see them last year, you'll see them the next year out come the white hairs. What are the white hairs? White hairs is where you've overheated the mule. You have scalded the mule. Now, there's no real way to get completely away from it. Uh, it's not a matter of a saddle pad. It's more of if you notice my bar on my saddle, it curves up in the front. Then I can slide my hand up in here. There, I don't have much pressure. But when you're going downhill, then the front of that bar is going to be doing this. So I said all that. Say this. You, there's not there's not any real perfect way to do it, other than trying to keep from scalding to start with. Now, how do I keep from scalding? I try and take when I'm right on my riding mules. I tend to take to loosen up my cinches every couple of hours when I take a break, loosen up my cinches, lift up the back of the saddle, shake it up and down a few times, let some cool air go through there. Now, I know that's hard to do with your pack animals. Here you've got them loaded down, and that's why them poor pack animals end up with so many white spots is simply because we, we couldn't let some cool air go through there. That's why I tried to develop the pad that I have, Dave. I've tried all kinds of ways. I've made my own wool pads. Uh, I've bought pads. I've tried different pads. Everybody that says they got the pad, I tried them over the years. And finally, I developed what I have now, which helps tremendously. But the downside, Dave, is when people have already used a wool pad or already used a wool felt and the hair follicles have died, it takes three to five years to get those hair follicles back again. So it's not an overnight fix, but I can tell you that I've got a lot of clients that said they couldn't believe the difference in using my pad 
and as the mule progressed, had less and less white hairs. Yeah, those white hairs wind up being a concern. And I think um, I was, I'm going through and making sure we've got all our questions, but I think you may have said it. Uh, you'll wind up having white hairs here or there at some point in time and they shed and they go away. I think you had mentioned that. And yeah. so the real thing that, that I've learned from you to be aware of is when, uh, when they develop real quickly, they're real pronounced. And when you don't do anything, uh, to, to prevent that scalding and change what you're doing, is that, is that correct? Am I understanding that That's difference correctly? Exactly correct. When you see that dryness there, you have dead hair follicles. So, what we want to do is try to have the least amount of pressure in that front cinch in the front. I read, and I, it's crazy, I read articles on, on the internet that says, oh, white hairs is from a poor fitting saddle. No, white hairs is because, number one thing, you're not using your rear cinch. You have to use the rear cinch especially with a, a mule youth imperative, it's the tightest. Now on a horse snug, and I mean snug, you know, not just barely touching, pull it up there snug. Oh, Steve, he'll buck. No, 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 no. That's not where you put the bucking strap. That's back in the, in the in back, way back behind that. Snug it up, let him sit and visit a little bit. Don't get in a hurry, uh, but snug it up. You know, the problem with the white hairs Again, is the saddle cantilevering right there, right up in the front of the saddle. And that's your fault because you don't have that back cinch tight and, and that front cinch is too tight. It's your fault, folks. It's not the saddle, not the mule. You didn't tighten the saddle accordingly. Now, you've got fat mules. You have skinny mules. You have tall mules and this sort of thing. Yes, they all still need to have the back tight, the back cinch the tightest. Now. When I put my hand in my saddle, right where I see it, sit, you know, where I want my saddle to fit the most is right where I sit. I don't want it tight in the front. I don't want it tight in the back. People, some, some people who don't realize the scapulas on the mules, they say they want that, beard, that bar to fit flat across that mule's back. It's impossible. Impossible. You can't do that because... Right at the sixth and seventh rib, right where you cinch it down, there is a fat pocket. Some mules, it's higher than the others. Some donkeys, it's lower than the others. You know, it, it, it's there. With that fat pocket, that tree, that saddle is going to rock. Not the saddle's fault. It's the fat pocket on the mule. Now, when can it be the saddle's fault? When you're riding in a horse saddle, semi-quarter horse, because it has a twist right at the sixth and seventh rib, right where that fat pocket is. So what happens is with that twist, puts kind of a port and it tends to rock back and forth yeah, across that uh, fat pocket. Very good. Uh, so real quick, I wanna, uh, we got a little bit of a late start. So folks were coming in a little bit late um, thinking that, hey, are they doing this? Are they doing this? So thank you so much for everyone for coming and making it. We had a, a couple technical difficulties and we overcame them. We are overcomers and now we are live. So Rebecca uh, says, hello, Dave and Steve watching from North Carolina. Uh, yeah. Preaching Cowboy. Hey, fellas, Brother Randy <laughs> from Rock and Cross Ranch Ministries, McLeod, Oklahoma. Y'all are doing a great job. Leslie's watching from North Carolina. Uh, Nadine is watching from New Hampshire. Melissa and Michael are watching in Ohio. Uh, Rebecca says, Dave and Steve, I cannot see the comments. Apologies if I repeat myself. Rebecca, no problems at all. We are so glad that you're here. Uh, Jay Bell, which I'm guessing that's not the Jay Bell who used to play for the Arizona Diamondbacks back in the early not or the late 90s, early 2000s. Of course it, it is. is. <laughs> yeah, right. Of course it is. Uh, Jay says he's watching from Kansas. Love these live shows and videos. Ray is watching from Virginia or watching from Utah. Ray Lockhart from Virginia watching from Utah. And we've got, uh, let's see, Michelle watching from Lenore, uh, Lenorai, Quebec. So we've gone international again. There we go. There we Another week we've gone international. Steve, the next yeah. question that I have for you. Uh, this one, uh, this one comes from uh, John, and John emails the message: Do I need to use a britchin and a breast collar with a pack saddle, like I do the same?
with a uh, with a, uh, uh, a a riding saddle. Is it the same setup with a pack saddle as it is with a riding saddle? Absolutely, absolutely. The only difference is the breast collar is going to be a little bit different on the pack saddle. The, when you're when you're when you're rigging up a pack saddle, you want to create a trapezoid. That's what you want to do. To create a trapezoid, and by doing that, each point of the breeching, each point of the breast collar help keep the saddle centered. The purpose of a breeching and breast collars is to keep the saddle centered. Now, when those cinches start coming loose, you, you don't always know it. So what helps the breeching and the breast collar? Now, the breeching looks like this right here. All right. These two straps that are here that go up on top, those keep the saddle from going forward. They help keep the saddle from going forward that inch and a half. The two straps on the side that go underneath the D-ring at your leg on the right and left help keep the saddle from going left to right. Now, it's not a 100% perfect keep because if your cinches get real super loose, of course, your saddle's gonna move around more, okay? Uh, especially if you're riding with a wool pad. That wool pad, uh, as you all know, I've seen my videos, it really makes the saddle move around. So, yes, that's it. Now, on a breast collar, breast collar is very different when it comes down to a riding mule and a riding donkeys because you're now riding and you're going to have a different stride on a riding mule as compared to a pack mule. So you still have on both collars, you both have the collar that comes right down alongside to the center and a strap underneath to attach the front cinch. But the difference is on the pack saddle, where the pack saddle uh, is going to attach up at the front bar and down at the cinch. On my Arizona cinches, I have a ring right and left. So we have a strap comes from the breeching down to the cinch, and my cinches are about 10 inches wide. And then, a, then from the breast collar, we've got a D-ring and a strap going up to the, to the cinch. So it creates that trapezoid effect. By doing that, since there's no rider on a pack saddle to help balance the saddle, when you take and, and create a trapezoid effect, it helps keep your saddle into place. Awesome. So would you wind up using the same, would you wind up using the same breast collar making those modifications? So you've got the breast, the beta breast collar or the leather breast collar that you're selling uh, on the store. C can you use the same one and just modify the way that you're arranging it or do you have to have a different one? No, you have to have a different one because the straps are in a different place to fit on the breast collar. Now, uh, for, uh, for the pack saddle, on the pack saddle, the breast collar attaches to the bar. On the riding saddle, the breast collar attaches to the pummel. And there's a strap that goes on the right and left side, and they cross in the middle, making an X. And then there's another strap that comes around. Here's the, the uh, left-hand side. Then there's another strap that comes around and goes down and buckles into the side. And by doing that, uh, that, that breast collar, as the mule walks, goes forward, goes move up and down. The problem with using like a pulling collar, worst collar you can put on a mule, is every time their shoulder hits that breast collar, it brings that saddle forward. So in a short time, especially with the stride difference on a rider compared to a, uh, uh, a pack saddle, that stride is way different. And so then you're going to be having the saddle pull it forward if you're riding in a horse breast collar. That's that's where it ties into the rings or like a pulling collar. Oh, very good. All right. Let's go back to our comments. Let's see here. We've got Yolanda watching from the Netherlands. Hello, hello Yolanda. And Suze Kuiper hey. is watching as well. Uh, let's see here. Dory is watching from Virginia. Uh, Paris from Atlanta. David Pingali is watching from Sonoya, Georgia. Uh, let's see. We've got Bob watching from Mississippi. Uh, let's see. MS. Is MS Minnesota? Which, what's the abbreviation for MS? Is that Mississippi or is that MI? Um, that's Mississippi. 
Mississippi. There we go. Uh, we've got Trisha from Washington, Sherry from Pensacola, Florida, uh, in Isabel will watch the recording losing too much with my bad internet. YouTube has frozen and I can't get anything on Facebook. Have a good one. Hey, Thanks. technology, we'll use it as long as we can, but this just underscores the need for real relationships in real life with real people because we can't count on technology to do it all for us. Isabel, we hope you're yeah. able to watch the replay later. Uh, yeah. Let's see. We've got Bobby Joe watching from Mississippi. Love y'all's live show. We've got Jeremy from Houston. Yolanda saying, yeah, we're so glad to have you guys here. Uh, my name's Dave. This is Steve. We're going to hang out here uh, for the next 25 minutes. What we want you to do is if you haven't let yourself, uh, made yourself known, go ahead in the comment section. Uh, let us know that you're here. Share your name and where you're watching from. Uh, go ahead, make sure you ask your question. That's the most important part of these shows. It's fun to sit back and watch, but if you got a question, we want to get those questions from you. And then the third thing is go ahead and share the broadcast uh, with your friends and family using the Facebook button below, the share button uh, below. And Steve, before we get to our next question, I wanted to ask you real quick, what have you been up to over the last couple weeks? You did a vacation, a trip to Alaska. Do you want to share very quickly about what you all did? Yeah, my wife and I went up there to, uh, to, I was doing a little caribou hunting and some sightseeing and some fishing, but that was our 51st anniversary. And so that was what we did for our 51st anniversary. It was also kind of a celebration of my birthday on August 3rd, the wife's birthday on August 4th. So that's kind of what we did. That's one of the reasons we couldn't get uh, to do that live uh, show uh, last Wednesday because we absolutely had no service. You know, we couldn't even get a radio program on the on the on the thing. So that's how desolate we were, you know. But I heard, Dave, that you did a good job and you were right in there, man. I was doing my best. I told him, I said, I don't actually know what I'm talking about, but I know how to repeat everything that I've heard. And I've heard <laughs> so much over the last 10 years. It's funny. When we went down there to the Andrada Ranch earlier in the summer, I got up on a mule, and folks, uh, you've heard me say it, I'll keep saying it, uh, I'm a city slicker. Through and through, spent my entire life in the city, but Steve is doing his best to make a cowboy out of me. We're even going to find a cowboy hat for me. I think David and Di from Arizona, uh, Australia said I needed to get me an Aussie cowboy hat, so we'll see what we can do there. But... I got up on the mule and I started riding. And there's certain things that I know that, that, that I've heard over and over and over again. But what we started to do was uh, I was riding back and forth and this mule wanted to go back to, uh, back to the hitching rail. And I wasn't ready to get off. And I said, Steve, what do I do? And he says, well, you want to, you, you want to, you know, uh, direction, impulsion, right? right? Direction, impulsion. And so I had to like really think about direction and pulsion and get this mule to go where I wanted him to go. And the other thing that happened is he was walking and he was walking straight towards the tree. I was like, what do I do? And he goes, right, left, right, left, right, left. And so I did right, left, right, left, right, left. And sure enough, he stopped. So it's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to do it. But I'll tell you what, we had a really good time. And what we did, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I opened up the um, I opened up the screen for uh, the where folks can go and get the mule saddle training course that we've got. A lot of folks been going through that, really enjoying it. And I went through bit by bit and explained, here's what you're going to learn in this video. Here's what you're going to learn in this video. Here's what you're going to learn in this video. And I gave myself an out and I said, you're, you'll have to double check if you have any questions. Make sure you ask Steve. But I was there recording these, so I remember what was in them. So we did it. We had a really good time. Everyone was a real good encouragement. And we had a lot of fun, yeah. didn't we, folks? Yes, we did. It was good. But we are yeah. glad that you're back. Folks are glad that you're back because they got questions that they need answers for. You know what I mean? Sure, sure. That um, Randy there, that, that that cowboy preacher. Yeah. Randy, he's, yeah. he's riding mules now. Hey. And what he's going to do, I'm sending him a saddle tomorrow. He's going to be riding uh, and roping. Uh, he's, a, he's He loves to rope. It's a, it's a horrible disease, by the way, Randy, but... The only way you can get away from that horrible disease is go ride a mule back in the mountains. But anyway, he's going to rope off of the mules, his mules. So I'm going to send him a saddle, and uh, he uh, he's going to rope off of his mules. So it's going to be interesting. So the next question that I have, and this kind of comes as a comment. There was a comment that came in on YouTube, and it was talking about bits. And so we were talking about how to get the mule 
to take the bit and uh, and uh, one viewer made a comment that you just go ahead and wrap uh, apple flavored fruit wrap on the bit to get the mule to take it and I saw that I was like hmm I've never heard anybody talk about that I've never heard Steve talk about it and so I wanted to go ahead and I wanted to get you to share a little bit about how do you get the mule to take the bit you do everything someone's listening here they do everything that you've told them to do and it just doesn't seem like the mule is packing is going to pack the bit can you share a little bit about how we go from we got the bit we hook it up to the bridle we get the bridle installed and we're getting ready to get the mule to take the bit how do we actually get them to take it and start packing it well you know that old deal of of uh of rubbing an apple on it or a carrot a little bit now that does that does do a pretty good job okay but number one thing to this this would be the steps that i would do Okay, number one thing, you take this finger right here. Hey, right? hey, hey, hey. And you take that finger and you rub, come on the right hand side, and you take that finger and you rub back and forth across them bars. There's no teeth from the incisors and, until the back teeth here. There's an area that there's no teeth unless you have a... Uh, a John mule, and then he has a canine, so it's not as long as it is uh, for a uh, uh, for a John mule compared to a Molly mule. But you take this finger and you put it in there and you rub those bars. Just rub. At first, they're not going to like it, but pretty soon, the more you rub it, the quieter they get. The head goes dropping down, and pretty soon, boom, they start they start saying, "Man." I want more of that. Don't worry about it. There's no teeth right in there, that area. You know, if you rub it in the right place, if you rub it back up in the corner, yeah, you might get bit. But for right in here, rub it back and forth. Folks, I'm going to tell you, you will see these meals start to drop their head, tip their nose to the left. And there's the next thing. Preparation of accepting the bit. Now, I watched Sam and uh, over in... Um, Willow, when I was there in Willow, uh, Alaska, and Sam went to put his the bit up on the, in his mule's mouth, and he come up in the front like this and tried to shove it up. I said, "No, no, Sam, don't do that." You know, and I showed him how you can rub the bars, get the mule to drop his head, then rub the bars some more, and then loosen up. Here's the next key thing. Listen to this: loosen up the bridle two notches. Never, ever, ever put a bridle on pre-adjusted unless you want to develop problems. That's when you start getting ear shy. People say, well, my mule's ear shy. It's not the ears, folks. It is the bit touching the bars, which are a little bit tender, simply because we try to fit that pre-adjusted bit on every day the same way. So the mouth got a little tender when you went to put the bridle on. The mule threw his head, and then you're thinking, now his ear shy? No, he's trying to keep you from bumping his mouth again. Loosen up that bridle, right and left side. Loosen it up, rub the bars, get your bit ready in your hand. We got a video on that, don't we, Dave? Yeah. We, we do. I remember doing that at that one clinic, and people were amazed. Folks, when you put a bridle on, they need to drop their head. They need to tip the nose to the left. Why do they drop the head? They're relaxed, but then that relaxes all five major neck muscles. The two muscles along the shoulder, the three muscles uh, along, the, uh, rib, along the neck, across the crest of the neck, down through the middle, and one along the esophagus. Loosen those up, and the mule gets relaxed. Listen, when you're trying to shove a bit in his mouth, he's all tense. He's as tense as you are. Don't do that. Relax. Rub that bar on the mouth first. Number one, do this three, six, nine, twelve, Dave. Three, six, nine, twelve. Three, rub the bars, the mule drops his head. Mm -hmm. And every time you do that three times today, then the next day, do it again. Do those three. And then if he does it right and you're happy with it, do three more. Now you got six. The next day or a week later, you do not have to train every day, folks. Don't do that. That mule doesn't have the capacity to take in all you're trying to flood him with uh, in a short time. 
your trainers, they shouldn't be riding every day. They shouldn't be putting time on them every day. Listen, what, what holds their mind of the new stuff that's not natural to them, that God didn't give to them, is not much bigger than a walnut. And that, new, that stuff right there uh, needs to be put in little by little. So three, six, nine, twelve. My, my meals, as soon as I go to set it up, they drop their head, open their mouth, take the bit nice and smooth. You know, it's us always, folks, that creates problem in Mr. Mule and Mr. Donkey. And that's what we love so much about our uh, our community here is we got folks who want to do the right thing, who realize that, hey, I want to learn, I want to grow, I want to figure out how do I make the changes in my life and my leadership so that it benefits my animals. And that's what I love about this community here. We got a question and you love these questions here. Uh, when it comes from folks who are having uh, experiencing some uh, problems getting the tack and equipment that they purchased from you to work. We love those because a lot of times it's just little subtle adjustments. And so this question comes from Sandy. She says, how do you keep the saddle pad from slipping out from under your saddle? I am using your saddle pad. Steve? Is she using my saddle? Okay. That's a good question. Now, because here's the thing. It, and, and the next thing is, when you take and tighten only that front cinch, there's nothing to keep with the back of the, that, that, that saddle pad from kicking out the back. Okay? So, number one, make sure the back cinch is snugged up so it will help cantilever from the cantilevering. Number two, make sure the front cinch is the loosest. Now, here's the thing. If you're riding in a horse saddle, it has a twist right after sixth and seventh rib. That twist will rub on that saddle and kick that pad right out. Kick it right out, you know. I, I run into that 25 years ago when I was trying to figure this stuff out. And that was before my pads. And now with my pads especially, they stay in place. So a couple questions. Number one, what kind of saddle? Number two, is the back cinch tighter than the front cinch? Number three, are you using a crouper? Because croupers allow the saddle to move like this. And when it does, that crouper can help split the saddle right out. Okay. Riding the breeching is the best way. So those three questions, type of saddle, front cinch tighter than the back, uh, back cinch tighter than the front cinch. And number three, uh, uh, breeching or a crouper. Croupers, folks, will not only get your mules back broke, and it can happen. I've got several stories I can tell you, but that also allows the saddle to move two and a half inches forward. And it sits right on top of the scapula. There we go. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we've got Jana watching, says, hi, Steve. We've got David Scholl. Yeah. Good, good Aussie morning to both of you. Good morning. Good day, right? Uh, we have got Linda saying, sorry, I'm late. You know what, Linda? The the little secret is we were a little late today, too. So it's yeah. all good. It's all good. Uh, let's see here. The next question that we've got, uh, this one comes from John. And John uh, sent a message uh, for his 14 hands uh, henny. I got a three-year-old henny out of a stan uh, standard bred 17 hand stud and a Jesus donkey never been messed with. Very skittish and just wonder where to start. I've had her for a week. I feed her. I try to pet her every night. And if she if she's tied, I can touch her a little. And in the pick, so she he sent a pick. You'll see a lead tied to her and uh, lead tied to her. And the post, she's lead tied to her in the post. She's a jumper. And if she gets out, I don't know if we can get her uh, to uh, get her took today. And I've been drugged and kinked and stopped out and lost her to a gate. So we got some problems here, Steve. Uh, what, uh, what, a, more backstory he says she's three, never been weaned from her mom. Uh, the old man that had her had some health issues, just couldn't mess with her. Uh, the halter was left on for too long, made sores on her face. Um, let's see. Just sounds like a lot of stuff going on here. What oh, should we do? All right. Now I want to make sure I understand this. This is the mother donkey we're having problems with, or is this a baby mule we're having problems with? Uh, this is a three, this is the three year old that we're having problems with. Three-year-old baby of the donkey and the horse. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Now, number one, uh, has the has the uh, meal been castrated? Why That's, does that matter? 
that that means mega things because uh, a uncastrated mule is the worst thing in the world to try to handle. They have a horrible attitude, and and they they can be the most vicious thing in the world. I think I'd almost rather fight a mountain lion as I would a mule that's not being castrated. They're horrible. So so their testosterone is running. They're always on the fight. They're always on the flight, and they are horrible to deal with. Okay. So give him brain surgery if he oh, has it's a, a it's a female, Steve. I'm reading right here. It's a female. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we're good there then. All right. <laughs> female. So it goes right back to then with this three year old. We need to we need to get uh, the come along hitch on this thing as soon as possible. You know. So maybe you might be able to put it in a squeeze chute. Uh, I I like to take my ones that are a little bit hard to deal with and put them behind a gate and squeeze them against the gate and have a rope where I can tie it off really quick and squeeze them against it so that I can deal with them. Then I can go and, and put my come along hitch on, you know, uh, which really works good. But I also like to use, if I got one really tough, I like to put the twitch on them and get some natural endorphins going by opening and closing that twitch and getting them to relax while I'm putting that come along hitch on. So when you got one that tough, it's it's tough. Now, I can tell you that if if I was there and I had an, another good roper like Randy, we'd uh, we'd we'd rope that mule, get a hind leg up and rope it and knock it down on the ground where it'd be the safest way to deal with it and then get it all hooked up and do everything by saddle and not by on the ground. Uh, that's the safest way to do it. Um, but you, you've got a long ways to go there. Um, uh, lots of trauma to that mule and, and this sort of thing. I, I'd like to hear more as you're going along. I would suggest my mule communication, um, uh, ground communication DVD, uh, and, and, uh, come along hitch and rope halter, but ground is where you need to start. All right. So we got another question here, and this one's coming in live from Carl. Carl's over on Facebook, and uh, Carl asked the questions. Um, I'm uh, new to mules, three weeks in, and he is uh, new to me mule. Okay, so it doesn't say new to mules. A new to me mule, three weeks in, and he is starting to pace the corral on one side. Any suggestions? The one, the one side that he's pacing are is is he by himself? Number one. Uh, the side is he pacing, is there other animals on that side, okay? Uh, and, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with that pacing. Don't let it bother you. Ain't no big deal, you know, and if nothing else, he's darn sure getting exercise. And you could use it to your benefit, and that is put a sur single on him, put a breeching on him, put a halter on him that's adjusted, and let him train himself to get framed up and quiet. You can also... Put the surf single on, bid him up, and take advantage of that walking back and forth. It's no big deal, folks. The mule most likely wants to be with his buddies on the other side. That's okay. And he'll, they'll, they'll walk up and down that thing for the next 25 years. I've seen it. There's no fixing it uh, with these guys, but you can use it to your advantage and hook up some equipment onto them and, and teach them to get soft in the face. All right. Uh, so hopefully that's some help there for you, Carl. We've got uh, Cal Boykin, uh, 4CA, watching over on YouTube. Hello. Uh, Linda from rural central Ohio. We've got William from Virginia. We've got Dale. What's up, Dale? Uh, still on vacation in Canada, and I am missing my mule for sure. Uh, and Carl just chimed back in. He says he is alone. On that he's one alone. we just talked okay. about, he's alone. He, he's just flat wanting something to do. So... Uh, at least ways that's better. He's not wanting to be with his buddies. But Carl, look, I used to have a pair of, of uh, uh, Shire mules. I mean, they were the, the most dandy wagon mules and pack mules you'd ever want. Really, really nice mules. They would stand at the gate every morning, weaving back and forth, back and forth. Give me something to do. I want something to do. That's all that mule's wanting to do. He's wanting something to do. So take advantage of it. Put a sur single on him, put your bridle and bit on him, your mule rider's martingale, and let him walk back and forth. He'll frame himself up. He'll teach himself to pack a bit, and also he'll teach himself to get halter trained 
with the halter as well. And he, you may think he's pretty good at both. They will get better if you'll take advantage of this. Awesome. Uh, Gary Green is watching. So, Gary, we're glad that you're here. Gary asked the question for you, Steve. He says, okay. how often should a donkey's hooves be trimmed? Farriers are expensive, and I used to go on a three-month time frame. I've recently have heard some folks say every eight weeks is, appro is appropriate, though it mostly comes from farriers saying that. What would you say? Six to eight weeks, especially with a donkey. They have the worst foot in the world. And the longer it grows, the more you get stuff packed up in there, then you're going to have disease problems, you know, uh, and this sort of thing. The shorter the donkey's hoof, the better, because you don't want that big pack up. So depends on how fast the hoof grows. But you have to also remember, it's the worst hoof in the world. One of the things that I was showing my clients up there in Willow, Alaska, was how to trim and how to set up that frog. And so, you know, Gary, there's there's nothing wrong with you getting a pair of nippers and trimming it up yourself. I mean, it's not that difficult, uh, at, by the way. You know, I've, I've showed a lot of people. I've taught classes at Pierce College in L.A. Of course, I've taught classes here uh, and around. It's not that difficult to take a pair of nippers and balance and trim it up. You always balance and trim to the slope of the shoulder. Very good. Uh, let's see here. Uh, you know what? I just had a blip happen and I had a couple people that were watching and I cannot see their comments. So, uh, folks, we have a couple minutes left here. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the comment section there and we'll make sure to answer them. I went ahead and I put a link to Steve's, uh, shoeing mules and donkeys video. And Steve, the question that I want to ask right now while we wait to see if anybody else has any is, um, it's, it's been, it's been something that's been pretty popular for folks to ask you about is um, isn't the mule and donkey's foot just meant to go without shoes? I've, I have never shoot them. I've never had any problems. Um, I always find that it's fine to go without shoeing them. Uh, and I know that that's something that you've heard and, and had some folks share with you. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know that you say, hey, folks, I'm just telling you what I've learned over the past 40 years. Uh, if you've got something that works for you, by all means, but here's what I've learned. Talk to me a little bit about the fact that you say you always want to have them shoot. Okay, here's your challenge there, people who do not want to shoot their mules and figure the mule is doing good. Look up the foot. Pick it up. Look at it. Make sure that the foot is symmetrical all the way around. Here's what you're going to find. There it is. You ready? Your front feet are going to be wearing on the outside and they're gonna be contracted in the heel on the right side, if not more. Now, <clears throat> when I was visiting with Sam and Renee up in Willow, Sam went to a barefoot school to learn how to shoe and, or learn how to trim barefooted with no shoes. And I said, yeah, I know the folks, I visited with her a lot and this sort of thing at, at clinics, but I said, what is contraction? And he said, I, I don't know. I said, wait a minute. This school did not talk to you about contracted heels? Well, not really. I said, all right, pick up the foot. And guess what? Both of the back parts of the foot was caved in back there. Caved in. And the frog was just a little tiny mess. And it was not healthy. I said, all right, now pick up the back foot. We picked up the back foot. We had a nice big white frog. We had a nice big white heel. But we had some contraction so that the frog was smaller on one side than the other. But what was the difference? The difference is in the front, folks, in the front, you have more weight from the shoulders and the legs, especially from the shoulders and the head. So that foot cannot take the weight of that head and neck. And so what it does, it contracts. Look at your feet. Pick them up. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you it might be one in a hundred of you that are going to tell us that, hey, my foot is fine. That's one in a hundred. It's going to be rare. But the biggest problem is, folks, we look at the outside and say, oh, there's no cracks, no chips. We're okay. 
No, no, no. Look at your frog. How small and skinny as it is. If it's small and skinny, especially if it's small and skinnier than the back foot, you have contracted heels. No foot, no leg. That pump, that frog pumps blood up and down that leg. And if you don't have a good, strong pump, you're not going to have that strong of a leg. And if you got no leg, you got no mule. No mule. Yeah. No. Nah. Uh, let's see here. Sid's watching from Fancy Gap, Virginia. We've got, uh, let's see, Linda says, I heard I uh, heard what you said about the back cinch tighter than the front, but I'm still just getting strong after my knee replace, replacement, and I've been using a single cinch Mustang soft saddle for my short rides. My rides are 20 to 30 minutes at most. Is it okay? I do have a big honking mule saddle in Britchin, but I'm not strong enough yet to lift that saddle by myself. I'm working up to it. So you got a physical limitation there and then you've got a uh you've got a you know the the mule and what they need how would you how would you talk about that there steve yeah yeah it makes no difference if it's two minutes or if it's two hours a front tight cinch is still killing hair follicles what you're doing is you are keeping that muscle those tendons you are keeping them from moving as they should get back and look at it now, I realize, yeah, you want to ride. And no, you don't want to pick up that heavy mule saddle that you got uh, and put it on. I understand, you know. But here's, here it is, folks. These mules will brace into pain. They will brace into pressure. And finally, when they've had enough, you get bucked off. You say, what happened? No, no, it was coming. The smallest thing. Go ahead and leave a splinter in your foot. And tell me how long it takes before you pull it out. You know, um, if folks, just a few minutes is too many, way too many. Uh, deal with it. Have somebody put the saddle on there for you uh, and, and, and make it work. You know, if, or do like uh, so many of my customers are doing now. They used to have the, the heavy Steve Edwards saddles and now they're getting older, harder to lift up things. And they bought my new trail light, you know. Uh, that trail light only weighs 18 pounds. Boom. You know, but look, folks, just because your mule is not showing that they are uncomfortable, they will show it to you down the road. It will build up. Now, be some of them that that's it's been been made uncomfortable so much. They know it as soon as it's coming and they go ahead and throw a fit because they've already had it in the past, you know. So there you are. That's maybe that'll help you out. You know, a little bit is too much. Yeah, uh, I think the key thing that you said right there, and, and Linda, I think something that's a that's a real big encouragement for you is that no matter how it appears right now, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, you, Linda made a comment here says the mule seems comfortable. No matter how it appears right now, it shows up down the road. And me being, you know, someone who has not spent time with these animals but has spent time around your ranch during clinics, that's one of the things that we'll hear, a theme that yeah. will come up. Hey, for the longest time, didn't seem to bother him. For the longest yeah. time, didn't show anything. And I think that's actually one of the really cool things about mules and donkeys is they have a very high level of tolerance for so many things. And they're just fantastic animals. They'll put yeah. up with a lot more than a horse will put up. And this is what I've learned from just listening uh, to Steve and listening to other mule and donkey owners uh, share their stories. And what happens is down the road it shows up. And what I've heard Steve say, and, and Steve, maybe you elaborate, elaborate on this a little bit, but um, you may make one little subtle adjustment right here, but that little adjustment that you made to compensate for something else here or there, it causes other problems that you have no idea that it's causing a problem, but you see it three months, six months, even a year down the road. Anything you want to, any examples you want to give there on that, Steve, just to help well, folks understand? Yeah, you bet. It's it's like your saddle pad. People will buy these saddle pads where you can add pads here and there, and they're trying to make it level. No, you don't want it touching the whole back across there, especially in the front. You want that saddle to be up off there as much as possible. Is it going to hit at times? Yes. You know, going down a hill, that's where it's most probable. Getting out there and roping something to where you're, you're you, uh, roping and you're pulling up a dally. At first, when you're pulling straight on until you turn and go, 
you still got that down pressure. So you want to try to eliminate that as much as possible. They brace into pain. They brace into pressure. Some of them have got a very low tolerance. Some of them have got a higher tolerance. You know, I've had people tell me, well, one buddy of mine in Ohio, his dad and mom used to come out here to the ranch and they, they lived out here. And then he'd come out here from time to time and they'd come out and, and ride and this sort of thing. And he says, you know, Steve, he said, I've watched all of your clinics. I've been at your clinics there at the ranch. I've watched them here in Ohio. And he says, I went and bought me a saddle, a mule saddle. And he says, by golly, he says, I thought I was really, I saved a bunch of money. It was a little bit cheaper than your saddle. I saved some money. And I thought I was doing good. He said, then I went on a, here it is. Here's the key thing. I went on a long trail ride. I took it down to Kentucky and I rode him. By the third day, I could not get on him at all. You know, I had a veterinarian tell me the same thing. He bought a saddle. It was a mule saddle. He bought one of my saddles for his wife. And uh, by the third day, he couldn't hardly ride that mule. You see, the, you ride them heavy, and then they're going to really show it up. The first little short two and a half hour rides, hour here and there, it's not a big deal. But when you ride them heavy, that's when it shows up. Then this vet told me he was actually giving this mule <laughs> different little shots to kind of get it quieted down. Well, he said, finally, when I started using your saddle, Steve, he says, by the, by the fifth day, I didn't have to give him a shot anymore. The mule stood nice and quiet. We rode off and we did fine, you know. So when he come back from that ride, the first thing he said was, I sold that other thing that was a mule saddle. He said, send me everything and make it work, you know. Um, I spent a lot of years doing this, Dave, and, you know, I've, I've done the whole cowboy writ, uh, role of blindfolding, tying up a foot, everything, blaming it on the mule. It wasn't the mule's fault, folks. It's not the mule's fault. Yeah. It's me. I am the one that is responsible to make my mule comfortable. And if I am the one, that means you're the one as well. It is you that needs to be the herd leader that needs to think of the comfort of the animal. Yeah. Uh, Linda, uh, Linda just said, uh, she goes, got it. Woo. A re any reason to buy a new saddle? She goes, he is very quiet. He's solid and he's trusting and he does put up with darn near, near anything. We love to hear that. Sounds like she's got a winner there. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. nice when you have one like that. Yeah. Cool deal. Well, that's it, Steve. It's four Oh seven. We got a little, little late start. We went over a little bit too. So, uh, thanks so much yeah. for making some time. Thanks so much everyone for hanging out. We're thrilled to uh, spend a little bit of time with you and we can't wait to hang out with you here in the coming weeks, spend a little bit more time with you as it starts to get a little bit cooler out, but well, at least out here in Arizona, it starts to get a little bit cooler out. Weather starts to be a little bit more favorable, able to get out there and enjoy the outdoors, maybe like we weren't able to during the hot and humid summer. And uh, yeah. yeah, enjoy uh, enjoy these uh, this great land that God has given us. Uh, folks, if there's anything that we can do, you can always give Steve a call, 602-999-6853. His phone number is available on the website, muleranch.com. If you want to send a message to me, support at muleranch.com. I can help you with your orders. I can help you find what you're looking for. And uh, never, never uh, hesitate to reach out. We want to help you. That's why we do these broadcasts is we want to help you get as much information out there as possible. And, uh, yeah, anything we can do, let us know. Steve, anything you want to yep. say before we uh, hang up for this week? Well, I apologize for running late. I come from the optometrist, and uh, I've got a little more problems with my eyes. So at 70 years old, i got to start wearing glasses more. So you're going to see more of that, unfortunately. Uh, and fortunately, too, it's just part of being older. But, hey. We're going. We got a lot of things coming up, don't we, Dave? We got a lot of really good stuff coming up. Things in the yep. works, uh, folks. If you haven't gotten that new mule saddle training foundation course, uh, you want to get that. Uh, let's see, mule. Let me get it here. Mule. And Dave, how easy it? How easy is it for people to get signed up for the newsletter and and to know what's going on with this program? Can they oh, just you, the front page, or how do they do that? It's absolutely easy. Um, if you sign up for this mule saddle course, you'll get it. And uh, uh, we have uh, we have Facebook ads or Facebook ads, Facebook posts that we put out there advertising this. So watch us on Facebook, uh, and you can go to the website and just go to uh, muleranch.com/contact, and you just type in your email there. Say you want to get the live stream notifications, and we can add you there too. 
Yep. Good deal. There we go. Right. Awesome. We're Thanks so much, these. everyone. Have See a fantastic ya. week, and we'll talk to you soon. God bless. Absolutely. Bye-bye.